Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the Sky Train is running at Sky Harbor. We'll have details of the new passenger transport train. We heard critics of the conservative group ALEC and its ties in the legislature last week. Tonight, we hear from an ALEC supporter. And tax time is upon us. We'll get the latest state and federal tax tips from the IRS and the Arizona Department of Revenue. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Futurist and architect Paolo Soleri died today. Soleri was 93. He died of natural causes at his Paradise Valley home. Paolo Soleri was one of the last living architects trained directly by Frank Lloyd Wright and is best known for Arcosanti, an ongoing, if slow developing, experimental city that Soleri began 43 years ago near Cortis Junction, north of Phoenix. The SkyTrain at Sky Harbor officially opened to the public yesterday. The train connects light rail to Terminal 4 and is just the first phase of the airport's passenger moving expansion plans. Here to tell us more is Deborah Ostriker, Deputy Aviation Director for the airport. Good to see you again. Thanks Hello, for Ted. joining us. Well, we talked about it when it was in its planning stages. It's here. What is the SkyTrain? The Phoenix SkyTrain is so amazing. It takes you, as you said, from the 44th Street and Washington Metro Light Rail Stop to our East Economy Parking, which is a great place to park, right into Terminal 4, where 80% of Sky Harbor's passengers are. Okay, how fast does this thing go? Well, it averages about 25 miles an hour, but it can go even faster, up to 38 miles per hour. It's faster than you think when you get on it. So if you get on 44th Street and you get, uh, how long to the East Economy lot? Three minutes. And from the East Economy, how long to T4? Two minutes. So the whole ride from Metro Light Rail to Terminal 4 is five minutes. And what kind of train, what kind of technology? Are we, are we talking about the tracks? Are we talking about the air? What, what do we have here? This is a state-of-the-art driverless train made by Bombardier. And it is, it's sunk down a little bit so that it, it's on a, dry, on a guide rail. So there's no driver, and it's all controlled by a control room. Interesting. Um, how long of a wait between trains? Three to five minutes. Three minutes in peak time. So the re reliability and the frequency is unbelievable because you always know another one is right, right behind the first. So if it, it, really, three to four minutes and poof, here comes another one. That's right. And, and unlike the buses, which were, were great in their time, and we continue to have buses to the other terminals, but you know that there's a train coming every three to five minutes now. And right now we're on this train heading toward the airport. You know, I got to tell you, that thing is elevated. There's not much to the sides. That's, uh, that's an interesting ride. Yeah, oh, there I am. Look at that. Yeah, that's there you are. There's the all, first all the ride. other uh, high mucky mucks there with the opening <laughs> ceremony. But that's uh, it, it, that, that is a ride, isn't it? It is. It really is. And, you know, we all expected the ride to be beautiful and scenic as you go up over that active taxiway that everybody sees. But what we found when we rode it the first time the other day is it's beautiful the whole ride. You really get to see Arizona in such a unique way. Now, the waiting areas, you don't have to wait very long, but describe the waiting area. Uh, uh, benches, seats, what do, we, what do you got there? So the train is designed for quick travel with suitcases. So the inside of the train, there are hardly any seats. There are a few seats in there, and the stations are beautiful at 44th Street and at the East Economy Lot and Terminal 4. They are they have public art inside. They are really they're worth going to see just to see them. And is as far as parking, now correct me if I'm wrong here, there is no permanent parking at the 44th Street light rail area. That's correct. The airport doesn't have any parking. Some of the hotels and properties around 44th Street in Washington do have some private facilities there where you can park, but the very best option now is the East Economy lot. Whether you want uncovered parking or the covered garage, that is probably the best place to park now because you just hop right on that train and you're in Terminal 4 in two minutes. But you do, there is a drop-off area there at 44th Street in Washington. There is a drop-off area and a cell phone waiting lot that a lot of people are used to. So what we're hoping is that this new transit Transit station will be a place that you can pick up and drop off so that you don't even need to come into the airport proper. You can just tell somebody to meet you at the 44th Street in Washington Station. And is there, there's a remote bag check involved here? Yes, there is, and this convenience is incredible. Both at the 44th Street in Washington Station and the East Economy lot, you can drive up give your bags. Right now with Southwest and U.S. Airways, no extra charge for that. 
give your bags there to somebody. They will check them in for you. You get on the train and off you go. Your bags are checked. Do you have to get there a little earlier for that sort of thing, though? You do have to get there a little earlier. I think the cutoff time is about an hour and a half, which isn't unreasonable. You'd be there anyway if you were parking, but now you don't have your bags. What kind of uh, cost to build this thing? I've heard upwards of $1.56 billion. What, what kind of costs here? That's true. For the entire project, once it's done, and that means going to the rest of the terminals and all the way out to the rental car center, the estimated cost in today's dollars is $1.5 billion. But what we opened yesterday, $644 million. Well, okay, so the, and what you opened yesterday was phase one. Uh, talk about the rest of the phases here. And this thing goes to what, like 2020? completed out? That's right. So in 2015, we're continuing to build right now. In fact, if you drive past Terminal 3 right now, you can see the beginnings of the next station. But we figured, why wait to open it? Let's open now what we can, which is to serve 80% of the passengers anyway. So the SkyTrain will go to the rest of the terminals in 2015. And then in sometime in the 2020s, it'll go all the way to the rental car center. Yeah, uh, this, uh, this is really something. Um, but let's, let's kind of get a, a 30,000 foot of view if we can here, Thea. Why was this built? What need does this fill? This fills a very important need, and that is if you've ever been to the airport on a Sunday night or during Super Bowl, we have another one coming up, or any big holiday weekend, you see the roadways get so congested, sometimes you can't even get up to Terminal 4 to pick up or drop off a passenger. And as we look into the 2020s, that's what the roadways would begin to look like every single day. So rather than wait until that happens, we needed to act now to build this so that we can grow together with the demand for traffic. Last question. Is there a message involved? Is there like a civic message? Because airports are often the first thing that out-of-town folks see when they get to a particular community. Well, this is really a, just another sign at America's Friendliest Airport of what we're doing for customer service because you can't be more efficient, quick, and beautifully transported than you can on the new Phoenix SkyTrain. Well, it sounds exciting. It's up and running as we speak, isn't it? It sure is, 24 hours a day. All right, seven days a week. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Ted. ALEC is the American Legislative Exchange Council, and critics say it's a corporate interest lobbying group that directs and produces model legislation for state lawmakers. Now, last week we heard criticism of ALEC's influence from the head of Common Cause. Tonight, we hear from a supporter of ALEC. Joining us is Tom Jenny of Americans for Prosperity. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for letting me be here. Give me a definition. What is ALEC? ALEC is the Air, uh, American Legislative Exchange Council. You can find it on the web at www.alec.org. There's no big secret here. Uh, they put their agenda out there. They put their model legislation out there on the web for everybody to see. There's no big secret to this. They're a lot like, uh, they're the conservative version of the National Conference of State Legislatures, which is kind of a more of a centrist, maybe center-left organization. And it's the same counterpart to the Progressive States Network, which is if you're a left-wing legislator, uh, you would probably go to the PSN. But we, we kind of, uh, we had uh, the head of Common Cause on last week, and I mentioned PSN, and I mentioned some other groups. And what he said was that these were not charity groups. These were actually lobbying groups, and ALEC is not a lobbying group. And he had some problems with that. And I want you to respond to the idea that it's an organize, organization that's filed as a charity. First of all, is that true? Uh, as far as I know, they have at least some element that's got to be 501c3, and a large part of what they're doing is putting policy ideas out there uh, for people to look at. 
And, and, and it seems to me, I just don't understand what the what the news story is, really. Well, the news story is that a lot of people think that they have undue influence, A, and B, that they're a lobbying group that says they're not a lobbying group. Do you see them as a lobbying group? I suspect if people think they have undue influence, that's people from the left who worry that, you know, mm -hmm. at one point, one-third of all the legislators in this country belong to ALEC. So it's a group with a lot of influence, but that's largely because conservatives uh, in state legislatures around the country have quite a lot of clout. We mentioned Bob Edgar on last week. I want you to listen to what he had to say regarding the idea that this is a lobbying group that uh, says it's not a lobbying group. Here's what Bob Edgar had to say. It's actually lobbying on the cheap. And I think what your constituents here in Arizona want, they want their representatives to come to the state capitol and do the best job they can. Listen not only to corporations, but listen to all sides of a particular issue. And they want lobbyists to be known, registered, and not hiding in the shadows. Do you think that Alec is hiding in the shadows? That's absolutely silly. Go to their website. You can find all of their model legislation on that website. Do we know who donates to ALEC on that website? I don't know if you do or not. I haven't checked with that. But a lot of organizations are organized as 501c4s, including left-wing organizations, and they're protected, actually, under a very old, a five-decades-old court case that was decided it was NAACP versus Alabama. And the courts rightly said that organizations uh, often want to protect their donors. Should those organizations, though, and again, I'm speaking from what, what the other side is, is saying and from what we're hearing from the other side, should those organizations, though, have that kind of influence in modeling legislation at various state legislatures around the country and, and, and having that kind, of, uh, that kind of contact with lawmakers, that kind of access that, that a public person may not otherwise have? Let's go the other direction. What if you heard of a legislator who didn't, who's down there at the legislature and never looked at any other states for an example of what to do? This person just sat there and didn't listen to anybody coming in, no lobbyists from any side, just tried to make up their own mind about legislation. Wouldn't you think that person was uninformed? You'd think that that person was not using the resources available. So if you are, if you're uh, center-right, if you're conservative, you go to ALEC and you network and you try to find good ideas for your legislature. If you're a centrist, you go to the National uh, Council of State Legislatures. Uh, in fact, we pay Arizona State, the state of Arizona pays for people to go to NCSL. Uh, and if you're a left-winger, you go to uh, Progressive States Network. The idea, again, though, and I think this is what, what I'm hearing from Common Cause, is that ALEC is, in a sense, defrauding. Uh, the tax code. And, and basically, uh, the influence is there. It's, I think you even used the word lobby. Uh, they are lobbying, but they say they're not a lobbying group. And thus, anyone and their brother can donate to them and then get a tax credit for it. Is that fair? First of all, is that right? Secondly, is that fair? I think you've got groups all over on the left, including, by the way, a lot of university professors who come in and basically weigh in on bills uh, that are before legislatures, uh, and these are 501c3, and you could argue that these left-wing think tanks and these left-wing university professors, that they shouldn't be doing that, but uh, in reality, we have a very pluralistic system, and there's a lot of give and take. And my concern, my big concern about this whole story, mm -hmm. or this non-story, as, as I think the case is, is that it kind of leads to a conspiracy mentality. Um, for instance, one of the big issues, and I think we should be focusing on issues, one of the big issues facing the legislature right now is the fight over the Medicaid expansion. Now, I could sit here and tell you that the hospital lobby, that the hospital corporations are going to get a ton of money from Washington if we do this expansion. And I could tell you that they've hired the biggest lobbyist in town, a guy named Chuck Coughlin. And a lot of people jo joke that Chuck is the you know, shadow governor and all this stuff. But that conspiracy mentality, that conspiracy thinking doesn't get us to the real issue. The real issue is, should we expand Medicaid in Arizona or should we not? And we think it's a very bad idea. The people on the other side, uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with the corporations that will profit from this, uh, there's a lot of people who don't stand to gain a penny out of this who still think it's a good idea. And I think we need to debate on that level, on the policy level. And we have debated on the policy level many times on this program. But then yeah. again, if I want to donate to lobbying firms, whether it's Chuck Coughlin or ABC over here, um, I don't get a, a return on that as a donation. Folks who donate to ALEC do get a return. And that's what I think the criticism is, that we're basically paying for this kind of a corporate interest lobbying group to have this kind of access. That's what I keep hearing. How do you respond to that? For better or for worse, the tax code is the way it is, and the case law is the way it is, and there are left-wing groups that do the same thing. 
and everybody knows how to play the game and everybody uh, invests where they want to. Mr. Soros, and I should probably do this when I say George Soros, you know, he's got a group of left-wing organizations that he's helped funded and, uh, and God bless them. They're out there in the policy arena. Some of them are C4, some of them are C3, uh, and they, they do what they can under the law. Last question. Um, uh, when Common Cause says a taxpayer support, taxpayers fund, and taxpayers subsidize ALEC, does that bother you? I think it's mostly not true. You if don't you, think it's true? If you look at the National Council of State Legislatures, that there is actually an appropriation from our legislature to send legislators to that and, and staffers to that uh, organization. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather they didn't use taxpayer money that way, but uh, it's not a huge amount of money. And a lot of the staffers will tell you that they get good information uh, from that organization. And, and um, you know, again, I, wouldn't, I don't think we should do that. I think we should zero out that appropriation. But in the big picture, is this corrupting you know, sending legislators to the National Council of State Legislatures, NCSL, is that, is that corrupting our legislature? I don't really think so. Tom, I'm glad we had you on. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A tax filing deadline is approaching, and every year there are new tax laws to consider and new scams to watch out for. Here to help us navigate this special time of year is Bill Brunson, spokesman for the IRS in Arizona. Also with us is Anthony Forcino, spokesman for the Arizona Department of Revenue. Good to have you both here. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us. Ted, thanks for having us. Uh, I want to start with you and sequestration. Uh, what's going on here as far as the IRS? I mean, all other federal agencies seem to be getting hit. What's happening? Well, right now we, we're not specifically certain of, as to how that's going to play out. So we expect that we're going to be furloughed uh, for a number of days, but we haven't seen the exact, uh, say, paperwork yet. They're supposed to notify uh, the employees within 30 days of the event, but it hasn't yet come to be. So there, there might, it might occur, it still might not occur, but... Uh, we're waiting to see. Okay, and that, real quickly now, Arizona, I want to start with, a, with what seemed to have been a problem here for a while with computer glitches regarding acknowledgement receipt of returns. What, what was that all about? What happened is uh, it's it really a, a small amount. Uh, what happened was in, in the beginning as we started, what we have to do is a reconciliation with the IRS, and that means that we send our acknowledgements through the IRS to get to the person. Uh, that's how it goes. But sometimes there are some glitches as it goes, and what you get is we do reconciliation with the IRS and say, hey, uh, they say, you didn't send this acknowledgement. We say, yes, we did, so we just resend it. It kind of got a little bit of backlog, so we had like about 40,000 that were sitting in a, in, a, in a hopper. Over the past weekend, we took care of all of those 40,000. Oh, really? And, so we're, and, and, and what's funny is even somebody at our work actually got filed, got their refund, and then they got their acknowledgement. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so the, the delay was there, the delay is right. gone. And it didn't mean that the return wasn't being processed. It just meant that the acknowledgement wasn't going. They would say, okay. okay. Um, let's talk about electronic payment here um, and, and the options that are out there with, with, with the federal tax system. What, what can I do as far as electronically filing? Well, your, your payment with an, uh, in that area, if you owe the federal government money and you owe less than $50,000, you can basically call the shots as long as you can pay that off within a five-year time frame. Now, if you're asking about electronically filed tax returns, yes. that's the way to go. 80% of all Arizonans are going to file their return this year. About 2.2 .2 million 
out of 2.8 million will submit it electronically. It's fast, it's accurate, secure, it saves the federal government money. It's truly a win-win situation for everybody, Ted. And you can use credit or debit cards, correct? When you pay, yes. yes. If you have a liability, you can use credit or debit cards if you'd like. Uh, that, that's certainly an option. Now, they're going to charge you a fee. And that's a fee between you and that yes. service provider. So just keep that in mind if you do decide to go that option. The fund withdrawals, electronic fund withdrawals from your bank account. Right. Uh, A-OK -okay as well? It certainly is. And uh, if you are, okay, that's if you file, that's if you got a life. What if you are unable to file? What choices do you have? <laughs> Run away, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically, you need to request the extension to file. It allows you an additional six months to submit the paperwork, not pay the tax. And you want to request this extension before midnight Monday, April 15th, which is the due date for the 2012 return. There's no cost, and you don't have to make a supplemental payment with it, but you just need to make that request for the item before midnight Monday, April 15th. And you can do that online electronically, and you can do it for free on irs.gov's website through the free file option. So this is, again, this is if you're unable to file, not if you, so if you're unable to file, do you still have to pay something to keep, the, to keep things going here? That was the old way, no. Now, is it a benefit to the taxpayer to pay what they can when they do file the return or request an extension? You bet, because it's gonna save them penalty and interest, but it's not a requirement. Okay, I wanna get to what happens if you're unable to pay here in a second. Sure. But back over to the state. Um, I, I noticed that there are some changes here regarding the use tax and clean elections. Tell us what's changed over the, the year. The use tax, as we talked about before, use tax is the tax you pay on uh, purchases you make from out of state, online, uh, that tax is not collected. And then you, as the individual, have to pay that. Last year, there was a line on your tax return which allowed you to pay that tax. This year, the line is removed. But the use tax is still owed. So why, why, why is that? Uh, it, was a, it was a legislative decision to remove the uh, line from the return. So you're not even reminded, but you still have to do it. Right. And in our booklet, we do have a page that talks about it and on our website and tells you where you can pay it. And is this, it, as far as the future is concerned, this is kind of going the way of the dodo, right? I mean, eventually, you're going to have to pay taxes on pretty much online purchases, aren't you? I mean, it seems to be heading that direction. That's the, the direction that most legislation, federal legislation, all that's going. All right. Uh, as far as clean elections now, clean that's elections, a change, too. Uh, yes. Uh, clean elections always had a checkoff box on the return where you could donate 5 or $10, and then you got a reduction of 5 or 10 or you could give a donation and get a credit. That's all been removed. So the, the, the checkoff boxes are no longer there. The credit is no longer there. The... Uh, the donation is no longer there. However, on this year's tax return, if you made a donation prior to August 2nd of last year, you can still take the credit for this year. Interesting. Because the law went into effect on August 2nd, so any donations that were made before that is allowed. But you better remember it, and again, there's no prompting. You've got to figure that out for exactly. yourself. Um, what happens if you can't pay your tax on time? We've, we've talked about unable to file on time. What about payment? Well, there's going to be a late payment penalty of one half of one percent. So if you're an individual that, say, doesn't have all their paperwork together and has a balance due return, they owe Uncle Sam money with that return, go ahead and request the extension to file, and you'll not have a late filing penalty of 4.5%. You just have a late payment penalty until that amount is paid off. And then what we recommend, the Internal Revenue Service recommends, is that pay what you can with the return and then get formally billed by the system and then contact us and we'll work out a payment arrangement. And these requests for relief can be made online as well? Yes, you can go to iris.gov, you can pick up the phone, or you can drop by one of our offices. But so much stuff, Ted, is, is available online at iris.gov, it's amazing. You, you don't really truly need to pick up the phone or, or come into the office anymore. And, and real quick, are there requests for relief that just don't cut it? I mean, I mean at what point do you say, no, we, we can't work with you? Or do you always say, we'll find a way? That's a very fair question. Um, if an individual is reasonable with us and communicates, we're going to be reasonable with them. But if we see a, 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 a history of where they've owed for multiple years and really haven't worked with us, then that's a different story altogether. Okay, uh, real quickly, another change, state uh, taxes here regarding uh, STO, school tuition organization. What's going on here? The school tuition organization, which is the credit for those donating to, to school tuition organizations that give um, scholarships to, for private schools, is what's happening is 
the, the credit that's there is five hundred dollars for single, thousand dollars for married, which is, which has gone up to five hundred three and a thousand six because it goes by inflation. So it's an extra three dollars. But a second credit has been created for another five hundred and another thousand dollars. So actually, you can give up to a thousand or two thousand dollars for that credit, and you can give it up to April fifteenth and still take it on last year's. Okay, uh, very quick. You have about thirty seconds left. What do we watch for? Biggest tax scam right now. What, what to watch out for? Probably a phishing tax scam where somebody's going to offer you, say, hey, I've got a 30 or $45 refund coming to you. Seems plausible because you filed and you may not have gotten everything that you thought could be coming to you. And they're going to ask you for personal financial information. Don't fall for it. Yeah. We, the IRS has already got your personal information, the financial information we can get if we need. If you get something like that and you're not certain, contact the IRS and we'll talk with you then you won't have a problem with those tax scammers. All right, guys, good stuff. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for joining both. us. Thanks, And Dan. that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.